here again, working in radio, working at the number one rocker, and I always feel that, that you, if you work in radio, you kind of feel the community before anybody else does, uh, whether it's on the phones or your mail or whatever. And so the Beatles did the Ed Sullivan Show. And as soon as they did the Sullivan Show, I'm telling you, our phones went off the hook. I mean, just went off the hook. And uh, I, I knew that something really, really special was about to happen. First of all, you could like Elvis or not like Elvis, but with the Beatles, you had four to choose from. And so when they did the, the Sullivan Show in February 66, they then announced that they were going to tour America. So because I was buying talent uh, for my little nightclubs, I went to GAC, the agency, and it probably didn't hurt that I was a disc jockey also. And I said, I would like to produce the Beatles. Never produced a concert in my life other than the Champs in Oxnard in 1958. So they said, well, the Beatles only want to play the Hollywood Bowl. And they had gone to Lou Robin, Lou Robin, uh, who later managed Johnny Cash, but Lou had a company here called Sight and Sound Productions. He was the only concert promoter in town. And they wanted $25,000. And Lou was used to buying Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald for 10 grand, and he says, I'm not gonna pay him 25,000. So he turned him down. So I didn't have $25,000. Uh, so I went to a storefront bank in Woodland Hills and the first bank I went to, Security Pacific, asked me to leave. They said, there's just no way. So I went to this little storefront bank. They had just repoed a motorcycle, and it was leaking oil on the floor. And the lady, the manager, Liz Miller, I remember, her son was a Beatle fan. And I said, look, I want to borrow 25000 She said, what's your security? I said, I got a house. I got a house in Calabasas that has that kind of equity. And so she loaned me $25,000. So... I couldn't get the Beatles without the Hollywood Bowl. I couldn't get the Hollywood Bowl without the Beatles. So I finally got everybody on the phone and we agreed on the deal. And does this woman at the storefront bank know that she's responsible for the Beatles? Oh, I hope, I hope she does because I've told the story many times. Uh, I, I, didn't make, I, I didn't make much money on the first one. I only made $4,000. They'd only let me charge $7 for a ticket, okay? The, the tickets were three to seven. McCartney just played the Hollywood Bowl and he got $350 a ticket, by the way. But uh, I, we were okay. I had, I had a couple partners, a fellow by the name of Mickey Brown. Uh, he and I owned that house together. Uh, and uh, we were okay until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, two busloads of marshals come in. I said, what are you guys here for? And he said, well, we're here to protect the neighbors uh, because the neighbors have complained you know, around the Hollywood Bowl. I said, oh, that's cool. I'm glad you're here. Who's paying for you guys? He said, you are. <laughs> I went, what? So there went the profit, really, right down the tubes. But I got real smart the second and third year because the second and third year I made more money than the Beatles did. Uh, I sold the promotion to the radio station. Uh, so it became KRLA Presents because it made them number one the first year. What do you remember uh, about working with the Beatles? The first year, McCartney and Harrison were very friendly. The second year, McCartney was very friendly. And the third year, they were very difficult. They had found drugs. Uh, and they were tired of their music. I produced the second to the last concert they ever did together. The, they went to Candlestick Park in San Francisco, and that was the last time they ever appeared in concert together. And I, the third year of Dodger Stadium, I paid them $120,000. They paid, they had an entourage of people, they had hotels, they had a chartered airplane, they had paid for the opening acts, these were the good old days. They paid for some of the security. If they made $4,000 that night apiece, I would have been amazed, you know. So they weren't making any money, selling our records, of course. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you a very interesting story. Third year, Dodger Stadium, we had a tent behind second base. And I told them, that, Lennon said, we got it, we're going to a party afterwards. We're going to, we gotta go to this party. I said, okay, good, I'll get you out of here. So I had, a, I had a Lincoln Continental in this tent behind second base at Dodger Stadium. And they jumped off the stage, they only did a half hour. Only, they would only perform a half hour. The opening acts and the Beatles come on for a half hour, uh, you know, sing Long Tall Sally as their last song, and away they'd go. So they jumped off the stage, got in the car, took off out the, out the center field fence, and I'm going to the audience. The Beatles have left the ground, you know, that old line. And pretty soon I hear the audience laughing, and I turn around, and here comes the Lincoln, and it's going chukunkle, chukunkle, chukunkle. There were 10,000 kids waiting for them out back, and they got on that car and literally sprung it. So now they come back. I'm going, the Beatles have left, and everybody's laughing. Now they come back in. We take them out of the car. We take them down into the Dodger dugout. 
and uh, they're mad. They're, they're, Lennon is really mad because he wants to go to a party. And we get into a, yeah, my partner, Mickey Brown, and, and we, we get into a real kind of a touchy situation, right, nose to nose, you know, screaming at each other. I said, okay, you guys want to get out of here? I'll get you out of here. So somebody had let the air out of the armored car truck that brought him in. They had let the air out of the tires. So the armored car went down to the 76th station at, at uh, Dodger Stadium to get air. So I said, come with me. We took him upstairs and we put him in the back of an ambulance and we covered him up with blankets. And I said to the ambulance driver, you just drive right down through the crowd. He said, are you kidding me? I said, there's 40,000 kids out there, but don't worry about it. They just drive right down through the crowd, go down to the 76 station, we'll get them out and get them on. So he's very nervous and we're walking on the peripheral and he drives right down through the crowd. And he breaks through the crowd and he's a happy guy and he hits the accelerator, hits a speed bump and the radiator falls out of the ambulance. <laughs> now here comes the armored car. And now the kids realize what's going on. So we get them out of the ambulance into the armored car, and there's the armored car, and it looked like an anthill. It was just stacked with girls, you know. And I, this security guard, he, was, he, he had his billy club, for God's sakes, you know, and he's trying to get these girls off, and he reaches down, he grabs this little girl, and she had a wig on. And he's holding her hair, and I'll never forget the look on his face, oh my God. But anyway, I don't know how this happened, but all of a sudden, the Hell's Angels show up. And the Hell's Angels lead the armored car out of Dodger Stadium. And that's the last time I ever saw the Hell's Angels and the last time I ever saw the Beatles. <laughs> you definitely sensed a difference in them over the years then. Oh, yeah, I did, yeah. They became uh, a bit tainted uh, and a, a bit more difficult to, to get along with. How do you feel that you were a part of, as a result, though, you were a part of music history, right? I was. Uh, because prior to 64, there, was, there really wasn't a concert business where you had, I mean, Dick Clark had some, he would take 15 acts out on the road, you know, the Dick Clark Cavalcade of Stars or whatever it was. But I think, I think the 64 Beatle Tour was the begin of, one of the beginnings of the concert business as we know it today.